we kind of have always believed like and you know i know one of your questions today we'll talk about some of the collaborations we've been fortunate to do but we've kind of always believed in the good karma that comes with focusing on collaboration instead of negative energy that comes with focusing on competition and that really starts with how we treat our co-workers like brian and i have never referred to anyone that we work with as my employee or mm. an employee of the of my company it's always been us and our co-workers um and so really the collaboration starts and is most impactful with how we work with and how we treat our co-workers collaboratively and then kind of concentric you know circles out from there with our retailers distributors our consumers um so collaboration is kind of the heart of what we do and uh that that concept of of ex- being on an exploration of goodness it has as much to do with kind of how we treat uh people whether they're customers or coworkers with the respect as it does with the exploration of goodness when it comes to you know recipe development and finding good ingredients ingredients that are all natural so that goodness we love how it speaks to both what we make and you know how we make it and and the, and the awesome folks that we make it with most of us never learned how to train our brains which is why most of us needlessly settle struggle and worse suffer my name is Chris Doris and i want to make brain training mainstream This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey everybody, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm your host, Chris Doris. And before I get to introducing our awesome guest today, let's take care of our, uh, as always, our one housekeeping item. If you're not getting notifications of, uh, or if you're not getting the um, daily dose, mental toughness tips in 30 seconds or less delivered to your inbox, your email inbox at 6 or 7 a.m. every morning uh, of the year, wherever you are in the world, then we totally got to fix that. If you're not getting notifications, if you're not getting my blog posts, they come out on every Tuesday, we got to fix that. And if you're not getting notifications of, of the new um, podcast, Tough Talks podcast episodes, then we just can't have that continue. So we can fix all that really easily by going to ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists, L-I-S-T-S, ChristopherDoris.com backslash lists. Sam Caligioni, yeah, baby. <laughs> Go Mules. Meaning uh, I, we went to Muhlenberg College together. I was a couple years ahead of Sam. We, we hung in the same crowd, though. And, uh, yeah, our mascot was the mules. Yeah, yeah, I know. They, didn't, they could have put 15 more minutes of thought into that one. The Muhlenberg mules. But, uh, you know, Sam has got to be, if not the most successful alumnus of Muhlenberg College, then he and I are a couple of them. <laughs> This is why I'm so excited to share Sam with you. I've really been looking forward to this. I went to visit the, the, his, so he's the founder, right, of Dogfish Head. It used to be brewery, now it's way more than Dogfish Head Brewery, but he started it in 1995. And uh, it has grown enormously. You know, I'll read, I'll read you his bio in a second. But uh, you know, I went and visited it it and all the places that have opened up the dogfish head dynasty uh and you know a couple years ago during the summer i flew back home and wow 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 what an incredible experience what an amazing culture just so many incredible products but the culture that he's created is just so much levity that's why i'm wearing this shirt today i chose this shirt for an interview with sam because because when i think of my experience with dogfish head the company the culture you know, the, you know the people, the vibe, lightheartedness is like a perfect word to describe it. But you know, here's the thing. All right, I'm going to drop a mantra for you, and this is like this is what Sam is, right? Inherent within your desires are the mechanics for their own fulfillment. Now, here's another way of saying it. Trust the organizing intelligence inherent within your passions. Inherent within your greatest passions, I am convinced, are all the ingredients for stratospheric levels of success. He trusted that. We're going to talk about that. He trusted that. He came out of Muhlenberg and he went and he 
pursued craft beer, crafting beer, crafting beer. And he just started this tiny little thing that is not a tiny little thing anymore. It's not a tiny little thing. It's a very big, very, very big thing, you know. And he's having a blast doing what he freaking loves. All right, let me read you uh, a bit of his uh, bio here because it's, it's so impressive. So he's the brewer founder of Dogfish Head at Boston Beer Company, right, which that's Sam Adams. They merged. Uh, he's been focused on brewing beers with a culinary with culinary ingredients since '95, when Dogfish Head first opened as the smallest craft brewery in America. Today, Dogfish has grown into a 400-plus person company, and is one of the most recognized breweries in the country. Dogfish Head is based in Delaware, with Dogfish Head Brewings and Eats, an off-centered brew pub and distillery. Chesapeake in Maine, which is uh, it says a geographically enamored seafood restaurant. I've been; to, those are right next door to each other. I've been to all these places uh, with the James Beard nominated cocktail program. The Dogfish Inn, a harborfront beverage themed motel. <laughs> what? Yeah, and Dogfish Head Craft Brewery, which is the production brewery and distillery featuring a tasting room and a kitchen. So they're currently Dogfish is currently selling. Beers, spirits, canned cocktails across the U.S. And in 2019, Dogfish had proudly merged with the Boston Beer Company. Sam Adams. How huge is that? How huge is that? So Sam's innovative style and collaborative spirit has earned him a reputation as one of the industry's most adventurous entrepreneurs and brewers. And he's authored four books and was named the James Beard Foundation's Outstanding Wine Spirits or Beer Professional in 2017. Sam, his wife Mariah... And their family reside in coastal Delaware. How impressive is that? Let's have a fun-ass dialogue. He's waiting for us. Let's go find him. Where are you at? There he is. Right there. There he is. <laughs> Recording in progress. My man. Go Mules. Go Mules, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Copper says hello. What's that? There, all right. Derek. I do that. Well, shout out, big shout out. To, I was going to say that to the end, but I'll have to big shout out to Degs Hops. You know, I think that you remember Grimmel? Of course, yeah. And Bingman, yeah. East, I think that East Kitch, right, right, right. Grimmel and and maybe Bingo. And I might have been the only people to call Derek Degs Hops. But anyway, thanks, Derek, for setting this up. You the man. Yeah, yeah we got to hang out when I came down there, and uh, when you gave us. You were busy in meetings, but uh, imagine that, right? But you you, you gave us uh, a beautiful old school hat hair package. This is badass, man. Yeah, and it looks supposed to look like the 1970s, the era we we grew up in. That's not say everything you do has meaning behind it. <laughs> Seriously, man, everything's so calculated and meaningful. It's so great. I love that. But first, let me just start with this. I I, I have to start with I mean, just like massive, massive. Congratulations to you for the unbelievable success of your hip hop album, Pain Relievers. I am keeping my day job as a brewer, but if stuff goes askew, I can always, you know, make a living off my eight followers on Spotify as a hip hop, beer geek, hip hop, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what the heck I'd call myself, trier. Very impressive. You know, I got to thank it back to the tribe that we hung out with at Muhlenberg. I don't think anybody would have predicted that your claim to fame would be hip hop. I think everybody would just said, yeah. guy's gonna, the guy's going to do some shit with beer or something. He seems to really like beer. Even in the college, I had that going from me before I was even a home brewer. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations again to you and Brian, Brian Selders, your, your, your co pilot there on that album. But seriously, joking aside for a second, yeah. unbelievable success. You know, um, the reason I chose the vocation that I've chosen, the whole reason this podcast even exists, right, is because I've decided to commit my life to one thing, really. I stayed with it, which is inspiring people to not settle, man, to, cr to create their lives on their terms. That's my definition of success, to, to, to not settle, you know, like and, to be, and to trust, man, and to trust something that we've all been well-educated to not believe which is that inherent within your passions are all the goddamn mechanics for success. You are the embodiment. You are the personification of everything I just said, dude. So in all seriousness, congrats, man. Well, thanks, Chris. I mean, we've been together. We are heavy here at Dogfish. And while I wrote the business plan for 27 years, starting my wife, Mariah, 
Uh, there's been hundreds of us that have helped to contribute to this uh, this brand's journey. So I'm proud to uh, have held the brand for so many years, but I know that there were a lot of contributions to people who had complementary superpowers to my own that, that made Dogfish, you know, grow the way it has. Yeah. Well, that's that's humble of you, and it's, I mean, it's true. Tell me about the motto. So Ralph Waldo, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So I want to hear about the motto, right, and, and yeah. the evolution of, like, the emphasis that you focused on in the motto. Sure. Well, I mean, as you said, the, 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 the raison d'etre is not settling in life and making sure you're kind of carping the bejesus out of every diem. Um, and so for us, you know, writing the business plan, I knew, you know, I was 20 something right out of the college we both graduated from. And I was an English major taking creative writing courses at Columbia after I graduated from Muhlenberg. And I was like, wow, I'm a good writer. I was a good writer in my sort of peer set at Muhlenberg. And now that I'm at Columbia, man, there's some world-class writers here. And I was like, I right, well, I'm a passionate storyteller. I love expressing myself creatively. So maybe I might not write the great American novel, but maybe I could write some really provocative and interesting recipes for beers uh, and kind of melded my love of storytelling and brewing, uh, and but didn't give up on being a, a business major. So the first page of the business plan for Dogfish at Brewery was that Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that I think your listeners will appreciate. It's relatively short, so I'll just uh, share it, which is whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name goodness, but must explore if it be goodness for themselves, for nothing is uh, at last sacred, but the integrity of your own mind, which is like you've said, it's about not settling. It's about believing yourself, uh, especially uh, if you're going on a journey that's sort of outside the status quo, outside the norm, that takes a lot of uh, courage and confidence. And it's that quote is all about not just having the courage to go the the courage to go on that journey, but to believe that you'll find like-minded people um, who will want to go on that journey alongside you. So you know, thank you for sending. You're very generous, man. And I feel I'm showered here. I've got all these beers. Are we are we drinking? Damn it, I'm not. Yeah, I want you to drink, but I'm I'm at the brewery, so I have to drive home, and I'm a responsible member of a public company board now so i gotta be extra careful but i'll have one when i get home if you'll have one there you go well that's, that's me that's one. me in liquid form uh, there's another one that, that is my favorite but I'll, I'll what's see. that well you'll see okay da -da -da -da, drum roll yeah man uh because i want to talk about it okay uh but i'll show you the i mean this uh, thank you for sending this man and congratulations for it this is kick oh. ass dude thank you we modeled that on the Beastie Boys book, which is kind of heavy in design and photography oh, on the history awesome. of their their journey. It includes like the voices of a bunch of artists they collaborated with. And similarly for our, oh. our 26th anniversary Dogfish book, we wanted to include the voices of a bunch of our coworkers. So I co-authored that book with my wife, Mariah, and another fellow English major coworker, Andrew Greeley, who I'm going to have dinner with tonight. He runs our pub in Rehoboth. Well, and, uh, tell him and, uh, I said, way to go. Great job. Book. Tell your wife the same thing. This is so kick-ass, man. This book is so fun. It's so Thank fun. You, Thank you. I, I can't wait. Like, now, as soon as we're done, this is going on my coffee table, and it's replacing okay. the Muhlenberg um, magazine that, that you're on the cover of. <laughs> oh, many moons cheers, ago. Cheers for us both. Cheers to you. I'm trying to figure out from the color of that beer. That's not 60 Minutes? Yeah, it is. Oh, no. Yeah, oh, this is the favorite one. I'll, I'll show you. This is. This oh, is okay. Yeah, I thought it was 60 minutes. Man. Call. Yeah, that's the one I just opened now, but I'm going to finish. Sweet. I'll give you. This is a hint. But oh, I'm not telling you. you, 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 you well, you'll Foreshadow. Thank you. You probably got it. But I tell you, I, I flew to Atlanta uh, last week, and this was my reading. This, this is fun. So many endless, amazing stories, so much history, so much thought that and creativity, brother, you are a creative freaking genius. And, and I just, and I love the depth at which, you know, you, you go into the creation, you respond to life with creativity. That, by the way, is one of my favorite definitions of mental toughness. Respond to say that again? The ability to respond to life rapidly with creative genius. Well, that's inspiring. I don't know about the genius part, but with creative courage, we've been doing that for 27 years. 
Yeah, I know. And it's, and it's really, so anyway, so pe- folks, the, the book is so damn fun. It's just a really fun, it's super informative, actually. It's educational and entertaining at the same time and inspiring. So thank you for sending that out, man. I My pleasure. It. But back to the Emerson thing, you said in the book, you start the, like the most appealing part of that quote, which is your motto now, was about nonconformity because you're a rule breaker. You were, how the hell did you get into Muhlenberg without graduating high school, by the way, dude? Geez, I guess we got to add the, we got to ask the administrators that. I think it's because my parents were willing to pay full, full boat. And they're like, ah, screw it. He's a full, he's going to, they're going to pay full ride. We don't need no stinking like that. Uh, diploma. Diploma, schmoma. <laughs> yeah. But that is pretty cool so because like, you know, and you're, you're cool. You, you, you know, you share it that you got um, kicked out of prep school mm-hmm. two months before graduating. March of my senior year. Yep. And yeah, you gave me a diploma. And most of the colleges I got accepted to revoked their acceptance. I think Muhlenberg and Ohio Wesleyan still would take me out of the out of their the kindness of their hearts. And I'm oh, glad I chose Muhlenberg. Muhlenberg. What, how happy are they? And then you end up in the cover <laughs> of the goddamn magazine. <laughs> That's <so> perfect. <laughs> That's great, dude. That's so good. But but it was the non so what you articulated though at some point in the book is that, you know, you, you said I matured over time as, ever, as the company has and all our products have and all that. Uh, initially, this, the part of the motto that was most appealing was about nonconformity, but then it's the part about goodness that really shines brighter now for you. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but. Yeah, for sure. You know, we, we kind of have always believed like, and, you know, I know one of your questions, they will talk about some of the collaborations we've been fortunate to do, but we've kind of always believed in the good karma that comes with focusing on collaboration instead of negative energy that comes with focusing on competition. And that really starts with how we treat our coworkers. Like Brian, I've never referred to anyone that we work with as my employee mm. or an employee of, the, of my company. It's always been us and our coworkers. Um, and so really the collaboration starts and is most impactful with how we work with and how we treat our coworkers collaboratively and then kind of concentric you know, circles out from there with our retailers, distributors, our consumers. Um, so collaboration is kind of the heart of what we do. And uh, that, that concept of, of ex- being on an exploration of goodness it has as much to do with kind of how we treat uh, people, whether they're customers or coworkers with the respect as it does with the exploration of goodness when it comes to, you know, recipe development and finding good ingredients, ingredients that are all natural. So that goodness, we love how it speaks to both what we make and, you know, how we make it and, and, the, and the awesome folks that we make it with. Elaborate upon for a second the, the, the phrase or term off-centered. Yeah, so that Emerson quote, while it's uh, inspiring, uh, it's too long to fit on the side of a six pack. So we condense, we condense the sentiment to a single phrase, which is off-centered goodness for off-centered people. So it still includes that concept of goodness from the Emerson quote, but it more quickly gets to you know what we believe we're we're making generating as the dogfish brand and who and whom we're generating it for. Uh, so it's basically quickly letting folks know, hey, our beers, our, our spirits, our, our pub experiences are going to be in, intense, flavorful, you know, vivid. They're not going to be sort of, you know, uh, generic or, uh, you know, uh, sort of monochromatic. Mm. Um, so so it's, it's letting people know we're, we intentionally are going to stand outside the status quo. And maybe that means we aren't going to appeal to the majority of folks with what we do. Uh, like the light lager, you know, drinkers who just want not to be challenged by beer, uh, per, you know, they just want something, you know, super bland and, and, you know, poundable. And that's cool too, but that's not like the journey that we are the folks that, that, that choose to, to, to buy dogfish are on. So, yeah. So off-centered is non-generic. Yeah. Off-centered ales for off-centered people, off-centered goodness for off-centered people. It's yeah. About, being a, a nonconformist and uh, going on a journey together that's outside of sort of the, the, the status quo. I do a lot of work with business leaders, a lot of coaching. Um, what, what would you say are some of the most important elements of a 
top tier leadership? Well, I mean, like I would say, you know, one would be for top tier leader, uh, especially in an entrepreneur. I know you've interviewed people with $20 billion company CEOs, but from an entrepreneurial perspective, which is really what I know, I'd say creativity is way up there, but I'd say resilience just as much when you're in a, t- in a small business up against, you know, Goliaths of your industry, regardless of what the industry is, whether you make something or it's a service industry, like being like unflappable with your resilience, just mm-hmm. for your own sanity, but also perceptions, reality, and the folks that have chosen to go on the journey with you, they don't want to see you riled or stressed or, uh, you know, uh, you know, negative or frustrated. So oftentimes we all get negative and frustrated and stressed, but it's important to be, you know, honest, but not to, not to show it, to, to, to be, to, to, you can have the humanity and say, well, this is a challenging moment and acknowledge that, but go into it with the positivity that with the help of those around you have chosen to go on the journey with you, you can be resilient and get through whatever challenges you're going to have. Because in an entrepreneurial journey, by definition, you're up against giants and you better be resilient because the odds are frankly against you, you know, taking over market share from market leaders. But that's the that's the that's the fun of the journey we're on, that opportunity to to challenge them. Well, you know, you just said one of my favorite words, right, which is fun. And whatever I could find in, in my observation of you, it looks like you have a whole lot of freaking fun, man. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and by the way, we know a few people in common. Word on the street is that you're not afraid of fun. <laughs> no, no. I'm fearless when it comes to fun. And what, and what we say here is, look, we're so lucky at Dogfish. We're making rum and beer and pizzas. We're not making nuclear armaments and, uh, you know, shackles for people going to jail. So we're pretty lucky that we get to make fun stuff. And so we say, hey, look, we we take what we do really seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously. And we do, we don't think it's pretentious to say we make art, you know, just like a chef is a form of art, an artist as is a painter or sculptor. Uh, We believe that making, you know, world-class unique uh, beverage recipes is an art form, but we don't treat it like some snooty, you know, art, artiste approach. We say, hey, yeah, we got world class skills to make these liquids, but uh, we're going to have a lot of fun while we make them and not take ourselves too seriously. Well, look, you know, every shred of human peak performance research supports that fun is fucking smart. <laughs> fun is, is, is a, a good lens to start every day day with. Well, Can I make I this stay fun? I chose this. I got a million of these damn shirts with mantras. Keep it light. I wore this one for you for, you know, for a reason. For multiple, I like it. It's got multiple interpretations. But the lightheartedness is a huge part of it. I mean, I was yeah. I, tour, I hung out at your place. Sizz, I went to all the places. The inn was full. I couldn't stay there. Too popular. I didn't. I didn't do enough homework in advance. In my resume. it's a tidy in. It's a small in. Yeah, it's cool though. All of the places are. You have so many places. There's so much going on. Oh, congratulations! By the way, on the one year anniversary of Miami. Wow. Thanks, Chris. And uh, yeah, I flew back from there yesterday. I yeah, think. was Sunday, Mr. Sunday. Was your buddy Mr. Bosch there? Chris Bosch, Hall of Fame basketballer, and I released our second beer together oh. uh, called Bosch Blonde. Oh, yeah. So, so he I... and his wife, uh, Adrian, and a bunch of his music and, and, you know, athlete friends were at Dogfish Miami, our newest brew pub, for that uh, beer release, which was uh, super fun. That looks cool. Yeah, good on him. A little shout out to him, by the way, you know, creating excellence. Giving so much back. Mm-hmm. Totally good on yeah. you. Good yep. Actually, in multiple ways, like, you know, the whole, I uh, forget what the things are called, but like, um, you got these. Beer Benevolence, the, the oh, community building program yes. that we do. And, yeah. and even like the, um, don't chuck your shucks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wow, you've done your research. Yeah, all the oysters, dogfish, we own a, uh, a seafood place uh, called Chesapeake and Maine, which is more, it's also the platform for us to do 
our experimental spirits. We distill gin, rum, vodka, whiskeys, and then we make cocktails with them. And we have our brew pub in downtown Rehoboth, which is more about, oh, there you go, nice. And, the, and we have our brew pub that's focused on more experimental brews and getting immediate feedback from customers uh, on our experimental brews that might be commercialized someday. And then next door is Chesapeake and Maine, which is a little bit more high-end seafood restaurant. And that's where we get feedback and trial experimental cocktails and spirits. And yeah, all the oysters from there uh, get recycled, all the oyster shells. So we try to be pretty careful about that, that, that environmental uh, opportunity that we have for continual improvement. Yeah, well, you're also doing the whole, I can't remember the initiative, but you'll tell me uh, it's here mm -hmm. on one of these screens about reducing plastic waste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, we're one of the first breweries to, if you go to our Rehoboth campus and buy the beer to go, instead of it being topped with plastic, uh, you know, there's these special like soft kind of papery, but really uh, intense type uh, uh, material that's biodegradable. It's actually turtle food instead it's of what? Uh, adding... turtle food. Yes, I tried oh, it. It doesn't, really? <laughs> doesn't taste very good. There are six pack you tried food, it? But I didn't try it. I ate half of a six pack topper. Uh, it was not very good, but I digested it against my stomach. Better judgment, yeah. And uh, and then yeah, and we can talk about like one of the most fun and rewarding projects I ever got to do because their brand was a real touchstone for us. Was I just got back last week? I was in Ventura, California, with Yvonne Chenard and the, the family and and leadership of the Patagonia Company and Dogfish and Patagonia Provisions. Just got to brew a beer and release called Kerns of Pills together. It's beautiful, earthy pilsner. So that was one of my most rewarding collaborations in, in, our, in our 27 year history too. Right on, man. You ever heard of um, Plastic Bank? I don't know. Are they, is it a credit system? Or they're not the no, ones they're, 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 So David Katz is the founder and CEO that I also interviewed him for the podcast and um, he started the company and, you know, it's about reducing plastic. Uh, way so you guys are collaborating without necessarily knowing that nice our dogfish patagonia hats that we uh that we did for this collaboration is, are actually made out of recycled fishing nets that are gathered oh, in the ocean that's kick ass uh, that. we figured with our nautical our nautical themed brand that'd be a great way to to do the the hats that's that's brilliant uh let's talk about customer service um, there's a vibe, man. You guys have a vibe everywhere. So I went to all the places. All right. And I, and I went, research. by the way, quick, what's that? You did your research one pint at a time. So. <laughs> at, a, at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, thanks to my comrade, Giddy Beer Chef Goldberg. His name is Giddy, like Giddy Up. Love it. He's the guy I went and traveled with to, to come visit all your, your places. He's he's in the obviously in the industry. He's a beer chef. So he's an nice. artist. He's an artist like you. Right, kitty. Yeah. And um, you know what? I mean, I made since he came up, I'll tell you what. Uh, I couldn't stand, I couldn't stand beer like this 10 years ago. Super like hoppy IPAs. Yeah. Hoppy, I was a Miller like guy. Yep. This the end. <laughs> old Milwaukee before that. <laughs> oh, geez. You've been uh, I mean, that, you get what you can get when you're 16. But that, I mean, I was just like, you know, you know, frat beer, yeah. frat house guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But thanks to Giddy, man, he has really um, sophisticated my palate. And I'll tell you, you what, all right, too. may as well, we may as well you're reveal. Too. We're going to reveal it. Okay. You, you ready? So I'm, I'll tell yeah. you what, the last thing in the world. See if you can identify this by the sound of the opening of the can. Hmm, that sounded less gravity, so lower alcohol than 60 minutes. I'm going to guess slightly mighty. You guess. C clutch. Yep, well, there you Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> he guessed it. Yeah, with sound. That, now it's now that's the mastery it. right there, baby. That guy can name uh, this beer in one can opening. <laughs> I love you. Dude. Years ago, I would cringe at this. Ah, not really, but like a full, like a real full sour. Yeah. I still, in fact, I still can't. Yeah. Ours is softer than a lot this of us. This is amazing. Sours. Thank you. That's my favorite beer that we I know it is. I love the story. Well, I love the story. Yeah. The history yeah. behind this beer is, well, I mean, that's true for a lot of them. 
But yeah, this I try it to be storyful with the recipes and that the story is kind of as hopefully as interesting as the drinking experience. Mm. Yay to that. It's very hydrating. <laughs> We're not allowed to say that. The federal government I can. mandates I that he can't say uh, any can health say claims it? with beer. I can't even acknowledge uh, the, the words. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't know. I just took one sip. I feel completely. I feel like I just got a um, an infusion of my own personalized uh, version of Gatorade, Jeff Gordon style. I got to meet Jeff Gordon. We should meet him. Let's what, we'll segue to that. What a great human being and athlete who had Gatorade create his own customized version of the damn drink to drink during you know based on his weight and this this yeah. stuff and then you just say i need to talk to your your scientists that's right that's are you a ted lasso fan love to i didn't get turned on but actually our ceo at boston beer turned a bunch of us on to that show right when it uh came out my wife mariah usually goes into the coal mine before i do netflix wise and came out and said oh, you'd really like this one and I mean, you know, considering your line of, of work, you, you know, he really is an inspiring coach, leader, you know, like a life coach, not just a sports coach for the, the people that are around him in a way that's like not like all ego. And all yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Service, so, man. Service, like yeah. caring about your people, like you. That's another yeah. thing I want to talk about. But the reason I thought of, of uh, Ted Lasso was but I was thinking about you and Jeff Gordon and Gatorade and scientists and how curious you are. Do you ever do you remember the episode where he was playing darts? Oh, that's we showed that in a company meeting when he oh, was that was brilliant. The top, Be curious. The confidence is all women. Right? Teach him. Well, right. right? Yeah, that was probably one of the best scenes in the whole series. I think it is the best scene of the whole series. Yeah. Be curious, not judgmental. Let's talk about customer service, man. That's a, I'm a huge, huge fan of excellent customer service. It's a big deal to me. You know, there's um, another guy I interviewed for the podcast. Is His name is Bob Berg. He's the co-author of a great book called The Go-Giver. Go-Giver? I'll write that down. G-A. Here, I'll show it to you. It's called The Go-Giver. Go-Giver. It's beautiful, man. It's really, it's, yeah. it's, it's probably the best book ever written on sales, and it's just not about sales, though. It's about what it is. It's about prioritizing, uh, bringing sick ass value, like crazy, stupid value, oh, way over concern, being concerned about profit. In other words, not not caring about it. It's letting, permitting your profitability to stratospherically skyrocket as a result of prioritizing, being bringing sick value. So yeah. I started to mention before I got a little distracted, I distracted myself, um, customer service. So when I was there, it was, it, it's just so obvious. The, the levity, this is another reason I wore this shirt, okay, today for you, because it's a reflection of how I felt while I was going to all of your places. I had, I'm very gregarious. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to have this amazing time. Sometimes it actually repels certain people if they're really not in a good space. But everyone, every single human being that I encountered at all of your establishments was fun. I like hearing that. It warms my heart. Yeah, man. And they love you, bro. (laughs) Good stories. Because I asked them, man. I'd be like, how do you feel about Sam? (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> and then I'm gonna follow yeah. it up. It's like I went to school with him, uh, but I'm like, how, is he a good leader? I, I asked him that. I seriously asked him that. And like, is he a good uh, leader? Is he a good leader? They're like, it was. It's they looked at me as if I'm an idiot for even like, is he a good leader? What is wrong with you? Well, I would say I'm, I'm. I'm not a great like org chart traditional leader. I'm not a good like check in one-on-one weekly here's your quarterly review i'm not good at, at, at that stuff and there's definitely better managers in our company that are amazing people managers but i do take pride in having a genuine relationship with as many people in our company as i can and pretty like you know with no concern on are they report where are they on the on the uh, org chart you know some of our favorite things like because we have a bunch of us that are way into like Marvel superhero movies because there's so many analogies to 
to to draw between the world of people with complementary superpowers in a in a comic movie and um, you know what you do in an entrepreneurial company and one of our fun things is we have a group that just meets and goes to the newest superhero movies together and it'll be like a fortress lift driver with a waiter with a you know a CFO with a blah 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 and, and those nights of getting everyone together um or, or just a, a really disparate group of co-workers together that share a passion for something other than quote unquote moving up the company you know org chart are really re- rewarding we also do something called beer 30 which is yeah. we all stop working on fridays at, at 4 p.m and we go meet and uh just have a few beers together um and again that's where do you do that different. so we have a room and i apologize for the banging in the background because it's in the opp which is not what you put, might think it is. It's the off-centered party place. So it's a private room in this facility that's literally under construction right now. In fact, after I get off our podcast, I'm going to go do a short video premiering the new and improved uh, OPP nice. for a short video for all our coworkers. So that's on Fridays. We do that. And uh, yeah, so uh, that that concept of, of customer service and being world-class. Another book you just... Yeah, you just shared The Go-Giver. I would share uh, Setting the Table by Danny Meyer, the great New York restaurateur, as an amazing book on hospitality that I think applies beyond just the hospitality industry and just to, into just being hospitable. Um, and you know that concept of goodness for us, there's nothing like religious about dogfish. We never like talk about religion, but to me that goodness concept is no different than godliness, just small g, and it speaks to sort of the golden rule. And you read even like super old, like, you know, sort of, uh, you know, business help books. Like you think of something like uh, Carnegie's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. So much of the same information between Danny Myers, you know, skipping almost a century between his work and and Carnegie's is, this, is about treating other people as you'd like to be treated and not being like, not being like, faults with your interactions about just trying to get the sale out of someone but actually caring about the people you're interacting with um and how how much that really matters in the long run karmically to to Mm. grow uh to grow a brand or a company what do you emphasize in with respect to um and you know in employee training or or ongoing training with respect to customer service, like, do you just hire great people? Is that part of your interviewing process? Like, how? What do you do? That's yeah. having my experience be so lighthearted and fun and playful and and good. Uh, what, what, like, well, I would say so. The, our, our interview process is pretty much it's like beer boarding, not water boarding, because it's pretty intense. And you, we we if if oh, your final oh. final candidate. Uh, we invite you uh, and you don't just meet with people in your department or in your sort of org chart work stream. We surprise you and and there's different people from different parts of our organization that, that will come in throughout the day. And they're mostly there to just see if you're a cultural fit. They might not know your job title or your actual you know job responsibilities, but they're asking questions just through a lens to see if you're a, a cultural fit. And then oftentimes an interview day ends with a unique component we call liquid truth serum, where we intentionally say, have a few drinks with us. And then we see if that person's an asshole or someone we want to have a few drinks with. And oftentimes- That's brilliant. (laughs) Yeah, you might not be surprised. I mean, Uber, I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the state, that's why part of why we have a hotel. And and they can just, we can walk them or sit in the backyard. Damn, I'm going to apply for a job. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah we, we actually named a beer liquid true serum after our hiring process where we invite people to have a few drinks with us at night and they show their real colors and usually they're beautiful vibrant colors that we want to be part of our tapestry but sometimes you're like "Ooh, that person went to a dark egocentric weird negative place we'll just peace out on this one roger that roger that <laughs> So you're only hiring enlightened souls, lightness of being. Once again, uh, you know what? Give me an example of a question that you would ask someone who wants to come work there that would help you identify whether or not they are a cultural fit. Hmm. Uh, I'll just sip some sequence over here. Yeah, you sip while I talk. Okay. Uh, 
I would say a fun one we've asked often is um, give us a hobby that you didn't think you'd want to talk about at an interview that you're you're into and sell me on why you think I should be into it too. So it's hopefully opening someone up to tell something kind of quirky about themselves, but then share their passion with you on why they're into this quirky thing because that might explain why they're interested in working at an off-centered beer company to some degree from a personal, from a personal perspective. That's neat. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say a word. Uh, the word is very near and dear to my heart. And I can reasonably guarantee really that the vast majority of people that are uh, listening to and or watching this will have no idea what this word means. And I want you to just talk a little bit about it. All right. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Scrapple. <laughs> so you and I went to college in the heart of the Scrapple belt. There's a Bible belt. There's a rust belt. <laughs> scrapple. The Scrapple belt, I think, runs from upper Pennsylvania, lower New Jersey, down to Virginia. And Scrapple is essentially a pork product, some might say a pork byproduct, uh, that's essentially all the parts that were not fit to go into a hot dog, make it into Scrapple. And it's usually just this mealy breakfast meaty thing that's got some savory herbs and spices in it, held, to, held together with a little bit of cornmeal. But then it's got like, you know, the parts of the pig that are not set for prime time lips and anus and eyeballs and delicious things like that. Uh, but it's absolutely a wonderful thing to eat. Lovely. Grew up on it, right? <laughs> Grew up on it? Yeah. We brewed a beer with it. We yes, brewed a beer called did. Beer for Breakfast beer that for- we had our local Scrapple company here make us an extra lean because you don't want fatty stuff in your beer. Yeah, I read about that. It, that was very interesting because it won't work, right? So, exactly. It won't hold its carbonation. It won't hold, hold its foam. There's Beer for Breakfast, an homage to a punk rock song by The Replacements called oh. All I Want to Do is Drink Beer for Breakfast. Oh, very nice. So uh, we made it with coffee, scrapple, maple syrup in there. All is this always syrup. available? That beer, no. I mean, a lot of the beers in our books, that book we're saying, hey, you know, some of the beers, you, you, we have to hiatus because you can't keep every beer in circulation. Oh, yeah. You drive your distributors, your retailers, and brewers crazy if you try to keep every beer you make fresh and in current commercial, you know, um, markets. So mm-hmm. we hiate, we never kill a beer, but we'll hiatus some beers and let them kind of sit dormant for a few years until our social media, you know, perks up and says, Hey, when's the last time you brewed Pennsylvania tuxedo or 61 minute IPA. And so we were always listening for which beers folks would like to see us take out a hiatus. And what we'll usually do is we have a small canning line at our little brewery in Rehoboth. Mm-hmm. And then we were a big canning and bottling lines at our big brewery in Milton, Delaware, both are in coastal Delaware. But when we bring a beer back, we just do it on our small system with cans and you have to kind of come here to get it. But we can kind of tell by how many people make a pilgrimage and share it on social if it's one we should consider bringing well, back for wa- wider distribution from the bigger right, well, I'm going to, uh, you brought it up. So I want to share with you a story that uh, experience I had very recently in Santa Barbara. Um, I was out there for a gig. I was doing a workshop for a company. They put me up at the Californian. Have you been in Santa Barbara? I, I, I think I've been in Santa Barbara, but I don't think I've heard of that. Well, of, across the uh, street from the Californian. I'm literally looking. I got. I checked in. I checked in early because I'd never been to sit there before, so I wanted to like experience yeah. a day and a half. Because I heard it's badass, and yeah, it is. And I was on my balcony in a room and I looked across the street and I see a sign for a place called Finney's Craft House. And I'm like, well, okay. how, thank you, God. For, this is <laughs> it's a sign. There's a wharf right behind me with all these seafood rush. And then there's like, this is everything. This is like I'm in heaven. So I cruise over there and I'm wearing my Phillies hat. I'm, and they put on a Phillies game for me. I'm sampling all their local beers and stuff and having a great time. And this dude sits down next to me and he's wearing a Delco shirt. Delco's a beer. Del- Delaware County. Yeah, yeah, near here. Is it a beer? Really? All right. There's also a beer named that, but it's in PA, right? It's what? It's a Pennsylvania County. 
Yeah, yeah. But yeah. he lives, so he's yeah. wearing a Delco shirt. That gets my attention. Turns out he lives though in Delaware, right? And and we get to talk, and and your name somehow came up, or Dogfish came up, and your name came up, and he asked me to relay a message to you. Okay. His name is Frank. Frank Dewan. Can you tell Sam that I'm a, a huge fan of his and been following Dogfish for a very, very long time? <laughs> he really needs to bring back Midas Touch. <laughs> bring back my Midas favorite, Touch. My favorite Dogfish beer. Great story about that beer, which is, he, he's right. That story's unreal. I love that's a like, mind blowing, cool story. Uh, he says, I got a few. Uh, 120 minutes aging. I also love the honey rum. Milton, Delaware is, is the top of my list of retirement spots. So I'll be meeting Sam some point in the near future. So there's a shout out, Frank. Now I know in the book, you say you will not bring back minus touch. Ooh. So, well, well, never say never, because yesterday I had a thread with the molecular archaeologist that first made the discovery of the residue in the tomb in Turkey that led to us, you know, bringing oh, that. from U of P? Yeah, University Doctor, of Pennsylvania, Dr. Dr. Pat McCover. There you go, Dr. Pat. Yeah, so I've been, I've been back in touch with him just to say, hey, what's something new that's old that is new news in the science world that we might be able to brew together again? I have a case of Midas Touch for him under my desk here at Milton oh. for Dr. Pat, but yeah, never say never. We, we, we will likely bring back Midas in small batches. Maybe when Frank retires here, he can help us brew it. <laughs> here you go. That's <laughs> awesome. Oh, that's perfect. Hey, I want to tell you a story, man, that you reminded me of. And, and it's, I was reading about bitches brew. Yeah. Another fave. So, um, man, you get to meet a lot of cool people or at least communicate and interact with a lot of really cool people. Man. People mm -hmm. fall in love with the, your beer, your products, and, and, and your culture. And um, so, but Bitches Brew is a tribute to, is inspired by Miles, right? Miles Davis. Yep. And there is this amazing story. Tell me if you know this story. It's a story about Miles Davis and Herbie Hancock. Herbie Hancock, okay, and it's a when they put Miles invited Herbie to come play with him live in Stuttgart, Germany, an outdoor summer cool gig, right? Mm -hmm. So Herbie's crushing, you know, keyboard, and Miles is doing Miles. Do you know this story? No, I'm interested. Oh, you're gonna love this shit. So uh, Herbie is playing and he fucks up, according to him. He he plays a chord that has him cringe. He's with Miles Davis. He got invited. It's like, woo! And he plays a chord that he describes as completely wrong. You can find this on YouTube because he tells a story. It's beautiful. So yeah. Just go on YouTube and put Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock. And uh, in fact, you know what? This, is, this would be a great video to, sh to share with all the employees because, man, it's so powerful. So, he, so he's like cringing, right? Herbie, he's, he's going, oh, God, no. And it's like the longest, like one and a half or two seconds of his life. He's waiting. And then he sees Miles and Miles reacts like, oh, nice. Look the mold. I didn't see that. That's off center, bro. That's off center. <laughs> and then does Miles start playing in that chord? He, he knew it. Yeah. He worked with it. And Chinese uh, philosophy is a term for that called Wu Wei. It means... Not struggling against shit. It's working with. Wu Wei. W-U, next word, W-E-I. So working with, not struggling against things. So Herbie, I'm sorry, Miles Davis, because of his level of mastery, was able to respond. He had the response dash ability to what Herbie thought was poison, and he made it nourishment. Ooh, that's a good way to put it. Well, my favorite Miles story was uh, when we did get to do that beer. Uh, with his family, you know, he passed by then, uh, but it was like the 50th or 40th anniversary of the amazing Pitches Brew album, which is really a, the first, like, you know, the most iconic fusion of jazz and rock. And so we did this fusion beer that was a fusion of like an African traditional honey beer called Tej and, nice. and Imperial Stout. And uh, so Miles's nephew who played on the album, great musician, his own right, 
invited us to Electric Landlady Studios and Jimi Hendrix Studio in New York. And we got to play on the reels, the original masters, the Bitches Brew album, while we were, you know, doing that and sipping beers. I said, you know, what, what's a really memorable exchange you had with your uncle around the time you guys were doing Bitches Brew? And he, and he said, I asked my uncle Miles one day, you know, hey, Uncle Miles, there's, you know, thousands of jazz musicians. What what made you stand out from that pack? And he said, don't play what's there, play what's not there. So you can think of that statement when Herbie hit the wrong note, but Miles was like, I was not expecting that to be there. Oh my God, I'm glad that was there because it was unexpected. Let's make something new with it, you know? Man, I got to, that's so beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. every I think that's every entrepreneur, you know, that's every that's every entrepreneur's opportunity is is the, is to play what's not there, you know. And your ability to play what's not there is compromised by you having a problem with what is. Your ability to play what's not there is enhanced by your ability to respond rapidly to every outcome with grace and creativity. Right, right. We were talking about the word resilience earlier. Yeah. Right. And that being like taking something in that's unexpected instead of getting mad or surprised, be like, okay, all right, absorb it and see if there's something you can do with it. That's, what that's, can I that's create? For good. This is a good question yeah. right, to get into that. Yep. All right. This is good stuff, man. Yep. Uh, okay. So I, uh, I, you know, I take requests once in a while when I'm doing a podcast and I took a request uh, from someone that, that, you know, um, from two people actually that you know, who are married, who are in the industry, who are very close friends of mine that live here, that are iconic presences in, in the beer world here in Arizona. Do you know who I'm talking about? Is it Leah? Doc and Melissa Osborne. Oh yeah. Doc, Doc, Melissa, yeah. Yeah, Doc requested that I ask you a question that Melissa told me not to. So that's <laughs> scratched. <clears throat> um, <laughs> But then the one that did make the cut is, can you tell a story about any bocce ball tournaments or after parties? Hmm. Well, they played in them. You know, we used to hold them in Arizona and California. We do a dogfish East Coast intergalactic bocce tournament and a West Coast. And we'd invite brewers like them and, you know, restaurateurs and distributors. It was just a fun way to compete without putting your beer down while you played an awesome sport. You had to roll with beer in hand and you'd get, you'd get foul points if you rolled without an active beer in your hand. So it really was an awesome way to bring people together over a fun sport, but lots of great friendships were struck up, you know, on the sidelines while you're playing for your uh, next match. Uh, one of my favorite stories is our ex-VP of sales, Adam Lambert, uh, English dude, very fair skinned, and he was having so much fun uh, playing bocce in the Arizona heat. You know, he was dressed as a, a female um, cheerleader in the skimpiest of uniforms with a little tank top showing his mid big midriff and a tiny little skirt. Oh, sexy. Uh, very, very sexy looking. Uh, but then he had high tube socks on like a dude for some reason that screw that look. And uh, he got back to Delaware and his skin blistered. He got so red. Uh but his tan lines were from his limey white skin to his bright red cheerleader marks was extremely memorable. I can't Brilliant. burn it out of my third eye. Now I got a show and tell for you. And if, if you could just give me a little context here. Sure. Oh, that's us. That's all of us. It looks like you had an 80s party. There's a young Derek Hoppler. There's a young Derek people... Hoppler. Those people were having a lot of fun. That, yeah. There's a little Bill Pank yeah. actually over there. Pank from Connecticut. Tommy Sabo actually. Sabo what's from going Vermont on with this now. Right here. What's going on with this guy? That's what's, me. I what's guess going I'm on right there. there. What, what are we I doing? I let my blonde locks. I let my blonde locks out in a wig that night. It looks like. And uh, Maddie Myers, soccer player. The Robo, the Robo cop. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. So what a wonderful group of folks. Uh, so yeah, that, that, we must have had a seventies party. Was that in the East? Do you think, Doris? Yeah, that's gotta yeah. be in East. That has to be in East. Yeah. Yeah. Right on, man. All yeah. right. You guys had a great group of friends, and you guys you we know, talk about not nonconformity. Yeah, your year. Derek was, you know, got to spend a lot more time with you socially. So I pledged a fraternity at our 
college that we both went to, ATO, and I still have great friends from ATO. But I'll say you guys were all the, uh, what'd you call them, MFIs, uh, MNF and independence, and you guys <laughs> banded together. So we're brother, not. Dude. I was a teak brother. Dude, that's I'm, right. I'm, but a bunch of those, like Sabo right. and Derek, and then I became. I, I became. I finished. Right. I started as a teak brother, and then I began. Yes. I got no problem. I love uh, t- you know tons of the teak brothers I stay in touch with. Yeah. Um, but I became an F-hole dude. Yep, F Hall was a de facto fraternity of just good dudes. So I, I remember hanging remember out the with beach your parties with um, Abdul and yeah. Gun and yep. Chadwick and the Gutter. Big room that had tree right inside the room. <laughs> good and Schmitty. Schmitty. Yep. You ever have any run-ins with Schmitty? Yep, yep. Good group of dudes. Well, no, no, Schmitty. 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 Well, oh, he was security. Security. He was Popo. Yeah, I don't like running right. him. Right, right, right. All right. Well, uh, what is there? What, what do you want people to know about right now? Well, I'd say you know we we had, our whole mission at Dogfish was to do these off-centered drinks. So we you know out of the gates in the okay. '90s were brewing like beers with coffee. Exactly. So those would be what I did want to say is the the definition of beer is quickly like blurring in America in a beautiful way. Where you know when Dogfish started in the mid '90s we would get made fun of for putting raisins and coffee and licorice and uh, pumpkin meat into beer. And that was when there were 600 breweries. Now there's 10,000, which is awesome. And there's tons of breweries playing around with culinary ingredients like we always had. But also really in the last five years, what's really happened is that what we call the beyond beer space. And it was really accelerated with sort of the rise of seltzers, the White Claws and the uh, Trulies, because they're essentially pre pre-distilled rum they're basically cane sugar that's fermented and then you're adding different fruits to them so they're still technically by the feds considered considered a beer um so when that started getting going off you know dogfish already had a distillery um and we were doing a lot of cool cocktails we're like you know what people are selling these seltzers in a can let's take our gins our vodkas our our rums and start blending them with different fruit juices, carbonating them and making canned cocktails. So now Dogfish had canned cocktails uh, are uh, uh, one of the fastest growing lines of canned cocktails in America. And that's really, we just kind of introduced our first variety pack of cocktails uh, a month ago. And you can get them like on, on e-commerce sites like Reserve Bar uh, and uh, at distributors coast to coast. So that's kind of our newest product line in addition to our beers that's providing a lot of growth and excitement for dogfish right now. Beautiful. Anything else we didn't touch on that you want people to hear about? Oh, let's see. Um, well, we mentioned we just opened Dogfish Miami. Or where where exactly is one. that in Miami? So it's in the arts district. For people who might have heard of Art Basel, the big art event that's in my, Miami. It's one of the biggest art events in the world in mm. December. And so our Dogfish Miami is in the Wynwood arts district of miami um really good beer really good food um and what else i mean uh come visit us we're in coastal delaware it feels like we're coming out of the heart of covid people are getting back on the road we have three different restaurants a harborfront hotel in coastal delaware uh you've been to all of them so you can endorse them as well, I hope. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, we're hoping folks will come out and, and visit us as we come there. Well, I'll enough. certainly be back. I come back all the time. I go, I go back with Giddy a lot, as I mentioned, who I went. So yeah. we'll, we'll be yeah. back. I'll Because I go back every summer, at least once or twice, to come home. I still, you know, I'm living in Arizona for 27 years. Yeah. Philly's still home. Okay, South Jersey's yeah. still home. I'm just out here for a minute. I'm a beach bum mm-hmm. stuck in a desert just for a skosh. I come back for Philly series, so I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll come down. I'll let you know in advance. Hopefully, we can get together. That'd be cool. I really appreciate you, man. I appreciate uh, you making time for this and sharing your lighthearted, you know, stories and, and, and wisdom and inspiration and success, brother. I'm, I'm very, very, very happy to be able to share you and all that you create and all that you give back uh, with my Tough Talks tribe. So thanks, bro. Well, Chris, you, you know, I was excited to talk to you and congratulations on your own business journey. But I got to say, I was really scared about how tough the talk was going to be if you're going to try and make me cry or anything. But you brought nothing but goodness and, you know, goodness is dear to our heart. So it was a fun hour to spend with you.
or I Amen, should say brother. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. All right, brother. Thanks, man. Peace. Cheers. Later. Remind me next time I interview a brewer if I'm going to be having any of their, um, if they're of their drinks to make sure I don't like drink the super strong ones. I'm glad it was just a 60 minute as opposed to the like a 90 or 120 minute IPA. I might be slurring right now because <laughs> I backed it up with a sequence. I can't. Even, I told him I can't even believe that I love this. It's 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 a really really like mellow, cool, refreshing. They call it a session sour, but years ago, no chance, no chance. But now I appreciate. Thanks to my beer mentor, Giddy Goldberg. But that was fun. That was that was a good time right there. That was every bit as fun as I I actually anticipated it being because he's just a fun dude. Isn't that great? I love the part of the conversation where we talked about the intelligence of fun. I didn't put it that way. Or maybe I did. I don't know. But it, it is. I mean, there's great intelligence and in fun, right? We talk about that quite a bit here in Tough Talks. The intelligence of fun. Fun activates creative genius, and he is one creative homeboy. Man, isn't that nice to see? Like I tell you, just witnessing the level of success that he has created for himself by pursuing his passion. He is he, like he's he's about as convincing uh, a piece of evidence <laughs> as there is that inherent within your passions are the mechanics for success. You know. And, uh, and he referenced that. He said it to Carriage. And I'm pretty sure he's glad that he demonstrated that courage to follow his passion and serve people. And, and I love how much credit he gives to all the great people that he has chosen to surround himself with, his incredible team. So that was great. And uh, as always, thanks for tuning in. And until next time, great miracles.